All right, welcome everyone to our panelist discussion where we're gonna talk about LabVIEW, Python, and a whole bunch of other engineering tools that people are using to build uh, complicated systems. So if you look at pretty much any software survey, uh, you know, Python comes in near the top as a, as a popular programming language, whether that's Stack Overflow or, you know, basically any other, you know, type software survey you see. Uh, but that's much broader lens than the test and measurement world. So I, I Googled or I, I, I searched for Python on the NI.com community and I got over 2000 hits. And some of the top hits were, um, how do I use Python with LabVIEW? How do I use Python with DDM? Uh, and so on and so forth. And there was some really good discussion on there about, well, uh, why would you do that? Why would you want to use LabVIEW and Python? Just do the whole thing in LabVIEW or do the whole thing in Python. Uh, and it, it, it kind of gets me thinking about a Harvard Business Review article I read uh, over 10 years ago uh, about, you know, people don't want a half inch drill bit, they want a half inch hole. So, you know, this discussion is really going to be about, you know, the right tool for the right job. What jobs are people hiring LabVIEW to do? What jobs are people hiring Python to do? Uh, and a whole bunch of other tools, right? We've, we've, you know, we've, we've been talking for a while, everyone, we've talked about, you know, GPRC has come up, Rust. Um, and so we wanted to get the experts together to kind of share their view of the world. And so we've assembled this, this panel and we're just gonna talk it out. So with that, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna introduce our panel. So first we have Jim Kring. Um, he's been using LabVIEW and Python for over 25 years. He's the founder and CEO of JKI, software and systems consulting firm in Silicon Valley. Um, he's a co-author of the book LabVIEW for Everyone, uh, a thought leader in the LabVIEW ecosystem, and has developed many great open source software engineering tools for LabVIEW. He holds a CLA cert and is a LabVIEW champion. Thanks for being here, Jim. Thank you, Brad. We also have Jorg Hempel. He's founder and owner of Hempel Software Engineering, a software consulting firm. He specializes in working with teams of software developers to increase the quality of software. He's a member of GDevCon and the DQMH Consortium. He runs a local user group and holds a CLA CPI and is also a LabVIEW champion. Thanks for being here, York. Thanks, Brett, for having me. Next, we have Sam Taggart. He's a CLA, CPI, CTD, and a LabVIEW champion with over 15 years of LabVIEW experience. At SAS Workshops, he focuses on helping developers transform how they approach software design in order to unlock new possibilities, discover better solutions, and most importantly, find immense joy and satisfaction in their work. Thanks for being here, Sam. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have James with Wiresmith Technology. Now, he's been working with LabVIEW for over a decade, focusing on the real-time measurement products. He's a CLA, CLED, and a LabVIEW champion. He's been working to include Python and Rust languages alongside LabVIEW in these applications to speed up product development. And welcome, James. Thank you. All right. So that kind of ends the, the formal intro. Uh, so I, I guess I'm curious to know, you know, because I, I sit in a marketing world as a solution marketer with an eye, um, you know, and so I hear about, you know, Python all the time and, and I see the popularity when we promote, you know, Python with our data acquisition products or how you can use Python with LabVIEW. And, you know, every time we add a Python feature, we, we just seem to pull in tons of eyeballs. So from my seat, there's a growing interest out there, but I'm I'm definitely want to know what y'all are seeing as the experts that are actually putting these systems together and working with customers. So I, I guess maybe I'll start with Jim. Like, what's your what's your take on 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 this? Are you seeing a lot of Python, or you know, what job are people hiring Python? Yeah, to ab absolutely. We're seeing a lot of Python. Um, I've been using Python for a long time, and actually, I was introduced to Python on one of my I would say first very, very long time LabVIEW consulting engagements. I was working with a team of engineers and the firmware developers that were working on firmware to control a tunable laser, <clears throat> very small device, built a, a communication library to, to talk to this device. And LabVIEW could communicate with the device and also uh, Python could communicate with LabVIEW to essentially uh, control certain functionalities of both the LabVIEW system and also the device. And what we found is that LabVIEW was really incredible for collecting data, talking to the instruments, and Python uh, was a great tool that made it pretty accessible to just about anybody, you know, with the text editor. 
uh, to create very simple sequential and and light scripting of uh, functionality. Like if you wanted to basically, you know, move the tunable laser from here to here, back and forth, you know, a thousand times and collect some data while changing the temperature. And uh, engineers could basically set up their own very simple customized tests. Uh, and that was huge to the project. And we still see the same thing today that engineers um, tend to know Python and it's, it's, the language is kind of like pseudocode because it doesn't have syntax. And there's probably a good segue into how LabVIEW is great in similar ways. Um, but most engineers kind of generally know enough pseudocode or Python to be able to take a template script that you hand them and customize it for their needs. Um, and so it's, it's a great way to make systems accessible to engineers. That, okay, thank you for that example. Let me, I'm gonna say back just to make sure that I understood it. So it, it, there was someone that was really savvy in LabVIEW that, that basically wrote a LabVIEW driver for this uh, tunable laser. And then there was a, a Python, I don't know, basically Python was able to control that, that LabVIEW driver, so to speak. Uh, and, and like you said, script it through the different steps. Yeah, so in this system, LabVIEW communicated with the hardware device through yep. kind of an API that the uh, that the firmware developers and hardware engineers gave us. Yep. And then Python was basically used as a scripting environment for yep. our LabVIEW application. And, and then at the end of the day, like one person, you really just needed one person to know LabVIEW really well to write that. And then anyone could that could uh, script Python at a very simplistic level would be able to control this tunable. Yeah, language. so that was kind of the end user operators scripting language. And there's a lot of reasons why, um, you know, that ended up being preferable than trying to have engineers writing LabVIEW code uh, yeah. for the controls, just kind of keeping those two things separate. Yep. And so, and so that from this, it sounded like that, that was a, a parameter, right? Like a requirement. It's like, uh, it, it, it kind of evolved, um, it, you know, it was successful. There was good evolution there mm -hmm. uh, because engineers could, could use that to do useful things. Yeah. Uh, everybody was like, oh, how, how do I do that too? I heard I can write a little script and <laughs> move the laser back and forth and change the temperature and collect some data. Yep. Um, and, you know, evolution is probably uh, another interesting concept there too with respect to you know the open source community and how python has literally evolved to be what it is through you know a worldwide community of people contributing to the language contributing to the driver set and it has you know evolved to take the form of easy to use lots of libraries highly accessible yeah great yeah great example yeah thank you uh james how about you do you have an example or what's your what's your take on, on prevalence of python yeah i mean uh it's, it's interesting as i've listened to jim thinking about what where have i actually seen it alongside projects and i've uh as you said in the intro tend to be working on more embedded measurement systems where python doesn't exist within the product but actually works as a really nice kind of parallel environment, mostly around the data analysis. So, so that's where I found it um, really powerful. So um, we're not quite there yet, but on, on one project, for example, we've gone, okay, you know, I can put the, the algorithms into LabVIEW, um, but someone needs to design, they need to look at the data in the first place and work out what they want to do with it. So giving them an environment through like a, a data notebook with Python, Mm -hmm. as a starting point and then looking at how we evolve that with LabVIEW and, and that's where you know things like the Python node are interesting we can bring Python in or we can look at how we can kind of combine the two environments because um, like you say you know it's the the prevalence of it makes it so so much of an easier thing to to put onto someone that isn't familiar perhaps or deeply familiar with programming certainly LabVIEW um who <laughs> have a job to do um and normally quite interactively and quite quickly i mean for me that's the thing where i've really enjoyed python 
I've used it in places where it's kind of more of a, a larger, long-lived thing, and the benefits didn't quite feel to be there as much as when it's we've just pulled this data file off the instrument and we yeah. want to try these different analysis routines quickly and see which one comes out well and visualize that data. Yeah. Um, and for that kind of environment, and like you say, being able to hand it off to people and have the support of the community that's there. Uh, yeah. I, I, I had a quick look before this because I, I was curious. Is it, the last survey reckons there's about 12 million Python developers, which means comes with, as Jim said, all the support libraries you might want. You know, if you Google a Python problem, you're probably going to get a thousand hits on how to fix it. Um, and that accessibility is a, is a real kind of key selling point where, you know, to sell someone here, go install that view. Uh, by the way, this doesn't look like anything you've used before. Uh, <laughs> spend some time learning it to just do this quick analysis is, is a much harder um, sell. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And Sam, I saw you shaking your head in strong agreement when, when James mentioned Python for data analysis. Do you have uh, experience there? Have you seen stuff like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't done anything personally, but a lot of the projects I've worked on, you collect data and you throw in a CSV file or database, and then some engineer somewhere else is pulling it out and doing analysis in, in Python. So that, that seems like a pretty common workflow. Pretty common workflow. Yeah. Uh, York, have you seen anything like that too? Just complete the whip around? Yeah, actually, I'm the outlier here because uh, as much as I hear about Python, I see very little about it, actually, I got to say, um, other than with one customer where they have a huge um, hardware in the loop system going, where there are all sorts of different teams collaborating um, from, from different um, areas of, of expertise, uh, where we have LabVIEW as only one, uh, one piece or one cog within the whole system and there yeah. there are lots of, of python programmers definitely also other languages too um but other than that i gotta say that um with my customers there's not so much exposure to the python world actually do you think that's um, like a regional or more like application focused like what kind of applications do you do you deal with so i would think that it's probably not regional because we have customers all over the world sounds a bit huge, but um, we have customers on different continents at least. So uh, that's probably not the reason. And maybe it's the maybe it's the the kind of work that we look for. So we specifically focus on customers who develop in that view, and we try to help them. Mm -hmm. And we're not so much going for I don't know specific systems or specific types of of projects or whatever. So that comes with the customer. If a customer has a lab view team, and we're involved with them. That's our customer. So I guess maybe we are focusing more in the lab view world specifically. Yeah, maybe. I, I guess where my mind, I was thinking like, it, do you are you seeing more? I, I, I apologize. I wasn't thinking globally. Um, I was thinking more, you know, like industrial automation or if if any type of that. I know some of our earlier conversations. I think you mentioned, you know, uh, connecting to PLCs and other types of uh, process automation. So I guess that's kind of where my head was. Is like, is there a, you know, a stronger presence of Python? in like the research and maybe validation phase but yeah if you get into like automation then then maybe it, it, not as much i don't know that's just what i was exploring yeah i guess that's that's very true actually uh like all the other guys already said if you want to be very flexible and very fast with analysis um python is definitely uh, like a good thing to use and uh, in other application areas uh, that's true i think that's just not there's not so much a use case for Python, if you're like, like you said, if we're connecting a production line to a customer database system, um, that's not really a use case for Python because we can do that with other languages, that view being one of them uh, pretty well. Uh, also, if we're looking at customers where we do lots of FPGA and real-time programming, uh, as long as there's not a lot of data that we need to analyze, again, that's not something where Python would excel. Mm. Um, so there's probably not so much reason to use different tools, which comes at an overhead, basically. And if there's no benefit to that, then there's the, the ROI is just not there for that, maybe. Don't know how the other guys see that. Yeah, that's a good point, Jörg, about FPGA in real time. Because uh, Python, um, you know, LabVIEW can be compiled, and NI has a compiler chain to compile to FPGA targets kind of natively and in a very high performance way. Um, you know, down to the pin. 
real time and I has a real time operating system based on Linux. You can compile LabVIEW to run code in real time. Uh, Python doesn't really have that kind of uh, tool chain, compile chain. It's not really intended for real time applications. Um, there are some compilers that can compile Python, uh, transpile it to C and build executables, um, typically for running in, you know, desktop or like embedded environments um, as a way of increasing the performance, but it's typically not for real time performance applications. I would even think it's not typical for a desktop application per se, is it? So if I want to build a small EXE from a customer, I think or I dare say that I'm faster with LabVIEW than with Python. Yeah, it's 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 harder in Python. If you if you look around, uh, there's a lot of searching for how do I create a user a GUI user interface application in Python, and then how do I build it into an executable? I've been doing a fair amount of work in the open source Python community, contributing to a project called Nutka, which is essentially a, a Python compiler. And it essentially transpiles it to C, and then it builds an executable, and it's cross-platform. And uh, I've been working to set up GitHub automation so that you can essentially take a script and then utilize GitHub's cross-platform runners to build executables for Mac, Windows, Linux, including like Mac bundles, you know, that have a pretty icon and you double click them. And there's really good integration too with, uh, for example, um, Qt for, for GUIs, which, you know, is also a very common GUI environment for like medical applications and things like that. So there is stuff out there, however, I don't know, the main thrust of the community is, you know, hey, you know, you can edit Python code in a text editor and you can SSH into a terminal and type Python, run your script. And the whole GUI user interface side and then also distributing built applications isn't really a thrust of the community. And it's also a hard enough problem that it requires product managers and user experience designers to actually design that at a product level, which isn't really the forte of the community. That's why, you know, companies like Microsoft building VS Code or, um, you know, PyCharm. Um, these are, you know, commercial products backed by huge companies to provide a very nice high level experience for end users. Just like NI has done with LabVIEW. <laughs> 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 I was just I was just thinking that yeah so you could, could talk around workflows and and tool chains right so it seems like uh, slightly differences different tools for different jobs based on uh, like what the end goal is so yeah thank you for that that discussion yeah the, the there's a little bit part? about what's what's a sort of a natural tool like uh -huh. what's a natural language for describing my desired solution to the problem or even describing the problem. Uh, and, you know, LabVIEW is very good at describing things that need to run in parallel, right? <laughs> like, I want to take this and do some math, and then in parallel, I want to do something over here, and then I want to deploy that down to something that can actually run that in parallel in hardware, like an FPGA. And so, you know, what, what language is natural for describing the problem and solution. But then there's the, you know, well, what tooling is available to actually get my description of a problem and solution down to the target. Um, and so, and then what tool is accessible to me and I understand how to use. And, and there's like all these different factors that kind of steer one into certain directions for what the whole solution stack looks like. What does my team know how to use? Can I yeah, hire yeah. people? Can I hire people to maintain the system? Ooh, that's a good question. How often does that come up, or are you seeing that come up more often now in the with the market that we're seeing? And I guess an open question to anybody, not just Jim. I'd say it's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> are, are your customers like how often 
are your customers talking about like maintenance mode on the software that you're delivering? Well, so they it's, care about it. Uh, go ahead, James. I've spoken a lot. That's right. <laughs> I was going to say it, it's not so much for the maintenance of the software, but I found in certain areas, certainly in scientific applications, um, I get a lot of customers writing client libraries, you know, kind of as Jim described the application at the start where we've got a lab view application with a TCP interface and they will write those libraries to interface with that. And, and yeah, I, I interpret that perhaps incorrectly as uh, exactly as you say, that's what the, they know already. Um, mm. And I think the language suits itself to this kind of higher level automation plane as well, I guess. Um, but yeah, I've definitely noticed that in certain areas it will come up more. Um, in other areas, people, there's a lot of, I've heard about it as well. So I've had another customer who's like, I've heard about this Python thing. Should we be using that here? And there's a lot of curiosity about it, I think, because it's got so much momentum behind it um, that, that helps drive some of that too. Yeah. That's interesting. I think I much more often hear the, the need for the hole than the need for the drill, actually. So I don't, I don't that often get like somebody to say, well, I've heard about this cool new technology. How could we use that? Uh, it's more often that we that we have like I've, I've used Grafana for example. I've seen that dashboard. Or I use that dashboard at home. Can we maybe use Grafana for visualizing our our data at work as well? So it's for my customers or my project. It seems uh, it's more like the end goal than the technology that they are after. Surprisingly, I gotta say, now that I think yeah. of it. <laughs> well, how how did you get your data into Grafana? I. <laughs> had my fun with implementing MQTT, uh, which was not nice because uh, I didn't know much about it. Mm. Actually, I had to make the brokers work and uh, deal with passwords and whatnot. Whatever. And did you use like Telegraph to to then push it off and ingest it into Influx? <laughs> well, without getting too into too much detail, I guess uh, that was the first thing to use Telegraph to get it into Influx, and then yeah. use Chronograph to get it to Grafana. So. Already the terminology is like ridiculous, right? You have chronograph and telegraph and whatnot. Uh, but we also use, I don't know, uh, data, other databases and, and try to make Grafana use those sources like simple MySQL, for example. Uh, and the other thing is actually that one of our customers, uh, they were happy to use Arduinos for simple sensor control, uh, sensor readings, and also mm. for um controlling colored leds to visualize yeah. the status of the test system so that all now goes kind of through mqtt and and like the iot paths and it works nicely i gotta say yeah cool yeah i've, I've been doing a little getting data into grafana lately and you're, you're you're right like you know grafana is a user interface tool for visualizing time series data right but like you can have lots of different database backends that feed into it. And then in terms of how you get ingest data into the database, there's like so many different options yeah. there. I actually heard it through the grapevine that a system link might be more, what's the word, connectable to Grafana in the future. So I've heard that there's some interest into that, which I can find awesome, actually. I think at um, one because... point, system link used a fork of Grafana, perhaps, or Chronograph in its stack. <laughs> OK. Yeah. So I don't know. Even if it's not a thing, I would like it to be a thing, actually. So if there was uh, like a way to use to configure System Link as one source for Grafana, that would be awesome, I guess. Yeah. But And even then, as you said, the customers don't necessarily want Grafana. They want what Grafana brings, which mm -hmm. is you know, a highly accessible web-based interface to time series data visualization where they can customize which data they're looking at over which time period and you know create their own alerts and widgets yeah. and stuff like that um, and a, a beautiful visualization at that because like yeah, a simple thing is nice easy to do but yeah it's really simple to create very nice looking visualization yeah. so that's that's great yeah and visualization too like if we talk about adding it to your application you know as a user interface developer it's a it's a rabbit hole <laughs> uh, uh, well i'd like to if i could just right click on this and then you know add an annotation or i want to be able to zoom in but when yeah. i zoom in i want higher resolution data and i want it decimated when i'm zoomed out and then, hey yeah 
And synchronize yeah. our five graphs, please. All of those should sync, zoom in synchron synchronized. Yeah. It's a pretty incredible uh, stack of tools that that we're talking about right now. Now I want to hmm. uh, go back to Sam. I saw Sam. It looked like Sam had something to to say. Wanted to give him a spot. Well, I mean, I think there's a there's a couple things going on here. Like one is just like choosing the proper tool for the job, right? Somebody mentioned PLCs earlier, and like what makes sense for the based on the job. But also, there's this we talk about programming languages and if we think about like speaking languages right the language is the way that you interact with and see the world and so that kind of shapes your choices and the, the things you do and the way you look at it and, and so part of it i think part of the rise of popularity of python is that that's a lot of people's first introduction to programming so that's kind of the way they see the world and when you see the world that way you know if you know how to hammer a nail and you need to put two pieces of wood together you're not going to grab a screwdriver and a screw even if the screw might be the better choice to put those two pieces of wood together. So I think that might be playing into the rise of Python as well. Interesting. Kind of like a programming language anchor bias. It's like yeah. the first thing you learn is what you're most comfortable with. Hmm. It's where you... Well, and, and Python is, is text-based. And what they've done is, you know, when I'm speaking, when I'm speaking to Siri, I add periods, exclamation points, right? <laughs> but but when I'm speaking to you guys, I might say import data processing library, you know? And then you say like, you know, define, you know, work, you know, do this, do that. And so, but I'm not telling you like, you know, curly braces semicolon new line <laughs> and so python python has has eliminated to the extent possible uh the the unnecessary syntactical uh stuff like you know semicolons aren't required because you just use you know a new line with indentation uh to define blocks and you can see it very clearly and um you know the code kind of looks if you read the code mm -hmm. to me i could probably make out kind of what it was doing um that's a lot harder to do verbally with lab view now we could draw it on a whiteboard in mm -hmm. lab view and um convey it visually and so i think python is very natural in a a verbal written communication mode and lab view is very natural and has gotten rid of a lot of syntactical excess that's mm -hmm. not necessary to describe things visually you know yep. here's my sensor it's a thermometer so it looks like this and i you know draw a wire over to where it's wired up to the little control loop and then oh yeah. it actually looks like a little you know loop because it's round and has an arrow that's looping and then yeah. uh you know everything's kind of flowing and so they're 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 both very natural python for text lab view for visual yeah. that that reminds me the one thing i like about lab view is i don't have to worry about the semicolons and the in the uh braces and all that stuff because it just kind of disappears when you're writing lab view code and i think that's one of the reasons as a lab view developer that python appeals to me because there's very little syntax in python mm. after there's, there's some other that more off-putting yeah. actually <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, not off more, that's I, not true yeah please I'm tell like, us more. yeah oh the for me, it, it's hidden the structure. Like, but maybe again, this is about what you're used to. So, other than LabVIEW, you know, at university I learned C and a little bit of C plus I didn't particularly get into it at the time. But I come to Python and it's like moaning about me because there's an in a couple of spaces on a line but no text, or I'm like I can't see it, <laughs> but mm. it's telling me. You know, I, I'm running a linter in, in VS Code, so I um I don't know. A bit of me feels like Python's gone a little bit too far. And, and, and hidden some of the structure. But again, that can be what you come to it uh, from. <laughs> and good tooling can help with that too. Oh right? yeah, yeah. And you think about like, what is good tooling these days? And it's, it's AI assisted development where you start like typing and it's like, I mean, it's literally kind of like Clippy <laughs> from, yeah, I'm dating <laughs> myself, but you know, Clippy from the nineties, <laughs> you know, like, ding, ding, ding. Are you trying to write a, a letter? <laughs> so uh, when do we get and, that and, in LabVIEW? 
Well, yeah, and it's 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 certainly <laughs> yeah. possible. That would be nice. Um, but yeah, AI assisted development will you know give you like the rest of your function definition or like oh you're building a class you probably need an you know an init <laughs> for the constructor you probably need like a string representation and all these other parts uh, and it'll suggest things based on all of the example code that it's ingested. Um, and so we're getting closer and closer to having tools that allow us to kind of express our intent and to have the, the unnecessary details, at least on the first pass to make things quick, the unnecessary details we don't have to describe until we want to dig down a layer deeper and say, well, actually, I said this, but I also meant that this part has to be extremely high performant. And so we need to go down to that part and further specify it. Hmm. But once it once it's running, and we can then observe that it's not performant in the way that we need. And so you can kind of take this iterative approach. And so uh, in terms of the types of applications, um, you know, I, I guess we're fortunate at JKI, we're in the Silicon Valley area and we do a lot of consulting work with startup companies, building high tech products, oftentimes like biotech instruments or semiconductor equipment or medical devices. And so, these teams of very sharp scientists and engineers want to get some concept to, to market out in the world working as a solution to customer project problems, you know, changing the world, but they need to start by very quickly collecting the data that proves that their technology and idea is viable. Then they need to very quickly get that working in an automated fashion so that it starts to kind of look like something that's productizable. They need to demonstrate the technology to investors and partners. They need nice user interfaces that their team and operators can use, plus nice user interfaces that, you know, a, a customer would look at this and go, oh, that looks kind of like a product. It needs to be cloud connected. You know, it needs all these things. And then ultimately it needs to be manufactured and it needs to be shipped to paying customers. And so being able to iterate very, very quickly, you know, with LabVIEW, with Python, to be able to talk to the web, be able to talk to lots of different environments is, is really important. And I think Python's flexibility coupled with its capabilities um, makes it a great solution, uh, part of the solution stack and architecture for enabling getting these ideas to market very, very quickly. And we're also pretty lucky too, because in the Bay Area, um, you know, a lot of Python early adopters are out here. Yep. And a lot of companies <laughs> who like, you know, Google hired uh, uh, Guido, the, the creator of Python for a long while. He's now, I guess, up in Washington working at Microsoft. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of Python uh, out in this area. Yeah, you, you made a uh, yeah, one thing you said in there that, that definitely resonated with me was the, you know, the, the combination and you kind of, I interpret that as kind of getting the best of both worlds, right? You can combine all the, the greatness from, you know, Python, the huge user base, and, you know, we've talked about the different, different approaches, even when, I'm, you know, describing a LabVIEW program, you kind of go, go minority report and you're like, oh, it's going to be parallel, it's going to branch off. Uh, so what I'm trying to, if, you know, if we want to put a really like sharp point on it, like what, what jobs are out there that you look at and you go, oh, that's definitely a job for, for LabVIEW. Like when, when that, when some, what, what keywords or what jobs definitely trigger the, like, oh yeah, I'm going to throw LabVIEW at that. <laughs> hardware the involved. The hardware, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard hardware twice really fast. I, yeah. I was going to say. I, oh, go ahead, James. Sorry, I was going to say, relatively to Python as well, performance, I think, is a mm -hmm. big difference. Um, yeah, so if, if, if there needs to be high performance control, so like an application like, oh, we have a microfluidic system and we're trying to like identify like cells coming in at a high speed down this, you know, micro channel and we've got uh, a laser and some photomultiplier tubes and we're trying to measure the fluorescence 
but we need to do this like in you know microseconds and then we have to make a decision within milliseconds as to whether we want this based on what it is that came down the pipe so we need to do the real-time analysis to do characterization and classification of what are the things that came down the pipe figure out what to do with it and you know python is great for doing all those things but then the question is where can you run that in a very high speed deterministic way and so for us you know i think you know lab view is great because we can run lab view on the fpga to do the high speed you know event detection early signal processing and you know we can then take the the data that comes from doing the control the high speed signal you know detection and even signal processing can be done in fpgas or you know gpus if needed and then you know, the question then is, OK, well, but the scientists come up and what they want to do is they want to, you know, load their configuration. They want to, you know, start up the, the instrument. <laughs> they want to do a run. Yeah. Once once they have identified that a thousand of the things that came down the pipe that they like has happened, then they want to stop. Then they want to load their data and they want to do some processing on it and then, you know, ingest it into their systems. So Python's a great way for them to do that, 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 yep. like in interacting with that system. Yep. So but I want to take a stand yep. for LabVIEW actually, because all of these things are where LabVIEW excels basically, mm. making it easy for engineers to connect to the hardware, to write a simple VI, to acquire the data to do simple things. So it's, I don't see necessarily that you need another language to do that. Um, but then again, I think LabVIEW programmers or LabVIEW users um, really are used to that level of flexibility and, and comfort. And and um, if you they are then introduced- yeah, well, if you they may are, need if another they, license. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, if they, are then, if they are then introduced to Python, they appreciate that, that there's another way to do things quickly and, and, and in a simple way. But um, we have lots of projects where there's no hardware involved because we like LabVIEW and uh, we can do lots of stuff with LabVIEW. So I think this, this recording would not be complete if we didn't take that into account that LabVIEW is very capable. So with all the talks of Python and everything else that seems to be great, uh, LabVIEW is also great. It, it is. That's so where the big the question, overlap is. How, how do you then get that team of engineers at that company that's your customer to then use LabVIEW as their means to do those simple steps one through five instead of using Python? Well, it's definitely points, points down to what you said before. It depends on the team. If you have a team of software developers that are all using LabVIEW for their daily work, uh, that's not so difficult. If you have um, a number of scientists or engineers or, or like people who have their domain in a different area and are not so fluent with LabVIEW, of course, something else might be a better fit. So, but that depends. Well, I think it depends more on the team than on the technical. Um, I want to mention for, yeah, that, yeah. I, for that use I, case. Go ahead, James. I was going to say, and I think at the level you're talking about, Jorg, is actually where there's a huge overlap with Python and LabVIEW. Both of them are, yeah, as I say, very accessible for those high-level tasks, and both of them seem like they can talk to anything. It's like whatever piece of hardware you get now, you can normally find a LabVIEW driver, you can normally find a Python mm -hmm. driver, and that's, I think, where these two come together so much, you know, in the same conversation, because they have that big overlap. Whereas if you look out at you know other languages that are out there, because there's plenty, you know JavaScript, Ruby, something like that, the hardware is the missing piece there, mm. you know, and that's where, um, and that, like you say, then it does come down to choice of well, who's on the team, what are they familiar with, uh, what, what do they want to use? Did you guys know that the like, and this is anecdotal because I don't have a link to prove it, but I'm I'm pretty sure that it's true. You can fact check me later. <laughs> Uh, the most popular programming language in the world, most commonly used, I shouldn't say popular, but is, uh, is Scratch, Scratch, a visual Scratch. programming language. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Wow, and, I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, and the reason why is because 
practically every elementary school kid <laughs> in the world is using that as their introduction to programming. And so uh, the idea that, you know, visual programming environments where you, you have a block, which is a loop, and then inside the loop, you can, you know, shove things one through five that need to happen in the loop, and nobody's asking you to clarify your indentation. Oh, you had a, an extra space in there before. Okay, now it's in there. Nobody's asking you to put semicolons on the right side of all these little statements. And it, it's a very great way for um, people who don't necessarily want to know about the semicolons and the indentations and stuff to describe a solution to their to their problem. So I think that that's interesting that a visual programming language is the most popular language in the world. And it's open source. And it's easy to connect to some simple sensors, right? Or deploy it to some simple boards, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, you can, you can even uh, yeah. compile Linux kernel modules. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy <laughs> because it because it transpiles to see people have done that. But yeah, there's I'm I'm being a little flippant, but yeah, there's a lot of hardware support for it too. So I, I yeah, really good conversation. But I think we're we're about at time. So I want to I guess we'll pose a, a give each around the horn a a final thought when it comes to kind of right tool for the right job and all the different software tools we've used around here. And then also, if you're interested, if you have a a handle on the NI community. If you want to if, promote your uh, your avatar name, so people can find you on the community, I think that would be good. So maybe we'll start with uh, start with James. Final thoughts. Oh, it's it's really yeah. I think we've covered it pretty well, to be honest. I think uh, it's using something the program is comfortable with, and yeah. meets the technical needs. And those two things have to go hand in hand. And it's funny we've come back to that quite a few times. Um, so yeah, you know. Python has the great support of the of the big community. LabVIEW has that visual element, the performance. Nine times out of ten, neither one of those wins, and it's just what you'd like. Nice. <laughs> and, and your username, username on the community uh, is James MCN from McNally. <laughs> All right, next uh, we'll do uh, Sam. Uh, yeah. So my takeaway, I guess, is that it's not an either or thing. They both kind of have their place. Uh, and I think uh, I think it was Jorg who said it depends on the team. Jorg and James were having that conversation. I think oftentimes we forget about the human side of it. And ultimately, it's got to be written by people. And so whatever they're most comfortable with, if they can do the job, then maybe that's the right choice. So. Yeah, nice. Thank you. And are you on the community? Uh, yes. I don't remember my handle off the top of my head. I want to say it's just Taggart, P-A-G-G-A-R-T. Nice. I think so that's right. right. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> All right, next on my screen, I got Jorg. Yeah, I think everything's been said. Uh, the one thing we didn't mention in this conversation, or I think you mentioned it, Brad, is gRPC as another, hmm. not programming language, but another piece that seems to, to pick up traction recently for connecting That's right. systems and also different languages that is. So it's very easy to set up that and share configuration, or connection configuration data between LabVIEW and, and, and yeah, Python and whatnot. So we've seen that a lot. Um, and uh, I guess it stays interesting because new technologies keep evolving. And I think it's a good thing to spend a little time in technology, technology research, uh, playing around with stuff and figuring out what, what can be helpful for the teams uh, awesome. that we're working with. Uh, I think my handle everywhere in the world is jorg.hampel. So that's J-O-E-R-G dot H-A-M-P-E-L. Nice, thank you. All right, last but not least, Jim. Hi, I'm Jim. You can find me by searching for JKI, and we're at jki.net. Um, but my my handle, I think, is Jim Crane. Uh, my avatar is a little, at least on the NI forums, a little guy with a surfboard. Um, so uh, my final thoughts are, I, I wish we talked a little bit more about Rust. Maybe we can do another one of these and talk about Rust. Um, I, I think there's an interesting conversation about like why do people love LabVIEW and is LabVIEW great at what it does? Why do people love Python and it's great at what it does? And why are people loving Rust? It is one of the most loved languages out there uh, on a survey of how much do you love your language? And why do people love that uh, for writing code? And I could, 
I'm, I want to talk with you guys for another half hour about all these things. So I think my takeaway really is um, look at what works. Why, why do certain things work and are they successful and do you like them? And um, what's, what's in common between different things that are good at what they do? And, and how can we kind of use them together? And how can we take good ideas from one and bring it over to the other? And then just realize that if, if, if we're doing systems integration, uh, systems programming for software engineers is about writing stuff on operating systems and cloud and stuff and under the hood. But for us, systems programming is talking to instruments and hardware. And so being a systems programmer means talking to lots of different things and being able to utilize lots of different environments to create a solution. And so uh, stay curious, explore, find what's in common and find the best uh, in everything and also to be plugged into the community and and contribute get involved open source um yeah thank you no that's a that's a great sentiment to to close on and so i guess i'll say thank you to our audience for for staying tuned and for you know learning uh, such great insight from the panelists so i'll thank the panelists again uh, thank you all for your time today and you know Connect with us on the community. Uh, my handle is Brett B. I think my avatar used to be a burger because my last name was Burger. Uh, so yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for hosting us. Yeah, no, I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much.